Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay, well, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming out extra early to hear Noah Snavely speak. Uh, Noah is a graduate student at the University of Washington. He's going to be finishing up his PhD this summer. And I've had the pleasure of working with Noah for the last three and a half years. Um, in 2005, Noah, his advisor Steve Seitz, and I were talking, and we decided to try how we could take photographs and arrange them in 3D to do something more three-dimensional than um, panoramas, and came up with the idea for phototourism. So that was a successful presentation at SIGGRAPH in 2006. Uh, we showed it at TechFest where Blaise Aguariarca saw it, and he decided to put his Sea Dragon technology together with phototourism to create Photosynth. And I think, I'm assuming most of you have already seen the previews out on the web, but if you want to make your own Photosynth as of last Friday, we now have a website internally where you can download your own photos and try it out. So Noah's going to be talking to us about some of the more recent research he's been doing in this area. Um, and he's also interviewing for a position in our group. Uh, so he'll be around th today and tomorrow talking to lots of people. Great. Thanks so much, Rick. Uh, and thank you so much for coming. I know it's really for you um, and for me, too. <laughs> um, I'm going to be talking about some of the research that came out of that conversation that Rick uh, mentioned. Um, so I'm going to be talking about uh, what we've done towards modeling and visualizing the world through internet photo collections. So part of the motivation for this work is that there's a vast amount of photographic imagery available online. So I don't know if anybody knows the exact number, but there's certainly billions of photos on the web. Um, these come from a variety of sources. So there's a um, very structured photographic record of these entire surface of the Earth um, through aerial and, satel and satellite images um, on sites like Virtual Earth and Google Maps. But there's also a very unstructured, massive collection of photos on photo sharing sites like Flickr. Um, so these are populated by people just uploading their personal photos that they took on vacation um, and, and so on. I'm mostly going to be talking about this more unstructured form of imagery um, through sites like Flickr. So Flickr itself is massive. Um, so this graph plots the number of photos uploaded to Flickr over time, uh, starting in 2003 and continuing almost to the present day. After a few years of pretty slow growth, um, in the last two years or so, it's, it's exploded to the point where there's more than 2 billion photos available on Flickr alone. So what do these photos look like? Well, essentially, you can do a search for any famous world site and find tens or hundreds of thousands of photos. So here's, uh, I'm showing a search for the Colosseum. And we've gotten back almost 40,000 images. This is, a, this is a very amazing, rich collection of photos. So contributed by probably thousands of people, um, taken at all sorts of different viewpoints. Different times of day, you'll see daytime and nighttime photos in there. Uh, different weather conditions, different events, different seasons. It's very, very rich, but it's also very unstructured. So um, because, because they've just been uploaded by all these different people in the cloud, there's very little structure. So for instance, the way Flickr presents these images is um, on these pages of, of thumbnails. So we probably got a few thousand pages of thumbnails of the, of the Colosseum, um, essentially, though, in random order. So if we want to do things like get an overview of the scene or find a particular photo, we'll have to page through these um, different pages of, of thumbnails until we find what we're looking for. It's not a very good interface for presenting these large collections of photos. So what I've sought to do in my research is use computer vision algorithms to um, infer and recover structure from these kinds of collections, and then um, create tools for browsing these more structured photo collections in 3D. So this problem. Uh, has really required advances both in the areas of computer graphics for uh, visualizing these collections um, and in computer vision for um, doing the actual reconstruction of these large and analysis of these large photo collections. So um, I'm excited about working on problems in both of these fields, and I published a number of papers in both computer graphics and computer vision forums. Okay. 
So I'm going to be talking about problems in several of these domains in this talk, um, both in the more computer graphics side, actual visualizing these scenes through these large photo collections, and in the computer vision uh, domain, how do you actually do this large scale reconstruction from these very massive photo unstructured photo collections. And then I'm going to uh, finish by talking about some directions that I'm very excited about working on in the future. OK, so I wanted to, you, probably a lot of you have seen this work. Um, I wanted to start by just briefly talking about the work um, I did on phototourism with, uh, with Steve Seitz and Rick Slosky, published, um, as Rick mentioned, in SIGGRAPH 2006. And the idea is that you can take photos like these, that the kind I've showed you, photos of a scene taken from sites like Flickr. And what our system does is automatically infer 3D structure from these types of collections. So what kind of 3D structure? Well, we can automatically recover the position of each camera where each photo is taken from. Those are those. Um, so this is a reconstruction of the Trevi Fountain from these photos. Um, so the, all those black triangles are p places where people took a photo of the Trevi Fountain. And we also recover this um, sparse point cloud representing the scene itself. This work really draws upon and, and in a lot of ways draws together several different areas um, in computer graphics and vision. So there's been a lot of work on image-based modeling, recovering 3D structure from images, and on image-based rendering, uh, the problem of taking a database of images and generating uh, new views of a scene from those images. Um, the crucial, one crucial difference is that in most previous work in these areas, um, you, you really require very controlled sets of images. So images usually taken by uh, a, one person with one camera walking through a scene, or uh, images captured in a lab under controlled settings. Um, here we've really shown how to, um, how to apply techniques like this to very unstructured, uncontrolled, diverse sets of images that you get from, from the web. Another difference is that we are also interested in providing good controls for navigating these types of scenes, which hasn't been as much a focus of previous work. Um, there has been work, however, in image browsing, which, which is related to the problem of navigating collections. Uh, in fact, there's been work done at MSR on using location information to enhance a photo browser, uh, the Worldwide Media Exchange. So again, but a, a lot of this work has required either manual annotation or, or GPS or other measurements to infer, to get um, location information, whereas we're automatically inferring this from the photos themselves and providing immersive controls for exploring these scenes. OK, so I wanted to briefly describe how this computer vision algorithm works for inferring structure. Um, the first step is to detect uh, repeatable, unique looking features in each of the input images. Uh, we use a detector called SIFT, developed by David Lowe. Um, so this, we use this to detect these features in each image. And SIFT is really good at repeatably finding the same feature in different images. Um, then we match features between each pair of input images, which gives us a rough correspondence between uh, matching features in these, in these images. This sets up a kind of classic computer vision algorithm called structure for motion. Um, it's usually been applied to controlled imagery again. Um, the algorithm I'm going to describe works well for um, images, more uncontrolled images. But the setup is this. You're given a set of images of a static 3D scene. So in this case, is a simple cube. You don't know where the images are taken from, and you don't know the 3D structure of the scene. All, what you do know is a set of correspondences. So you have these matching points in all of these images. Uh, so I'm showing this with these color-coded dots. The problem is now to recover the 3D points uh, in the scene. So I'm denoting these as P. And recover the 3D camera parameters, so the rotation R and translation or position T of each camera. Um, and how do you do this? Well, basically, we're going to use the geomet geometric constraints given by these point matches. So the constraint is that if we take any point that we recover and project it into a camera, the, it should project close to where we observe that point. So we can set this up as an optimization problem where we're trying to minimize these reprojection errors over all the images. So here we're we're um, specifying this objective function f, 
which is the sum of squared root projection errors, and we want to minimize this over all the parameters, the rotations, translations, and 3D point positions, P. The problem with this is that this, this objective function tends to be very nonlinear and has a lot of local minima. It also can be very, very large. So um, this scene has, what, six points and, oh, I guess eight, yeah, seven points and three cameras. A typical scene that we, we, we um, want to reconstruct, though, may have hundreds of thousands of points and hundreds or thousands of cameras. So that involves thou hundreds of thousands or millions of parameters, and it can be very difficult to optimize these all at once. So what we do, yes, Singbing. So you're actually computing the focal lengths also, right? Right. I, this, this is a somewhat simplified version of the problem. We do compute the focal length as well as two uh, radial distortion coefficients. Um, so yeah, it's slightly more complex than what I'm uh, spelling out here. Um, so so that, that only serves to make it even more nonlinear, though, um, and also a little bit ill-constrained if you don't have good priors on the, on the focal length. Um, by the way, feel free to ask questions throughout the talk. I'm, it makes it more fun, too. Um, so what we do to solve this problem is start small and then grow um, until we've reconstructed the entire model. So we start with a few parameters and then add more and more until we've optimized the whole thing. So the system first selects a pair of images to reconstruct. So here's a small reconstruction from uh, a pair of images. Let's see. Whoops. OK, th there might have been a, a small glitch with this video. Let me try again. OK, here we go. Phew. So here's a two-frame reconstruction of the Trevi Fountain. And then the system selects a few more images to add, um, adds those images, adds points to the scenes, uh, scene, and refines the model until all the images that it can add are added. So this animation shows the process of incrementally building up the scene. So you'll see cameras being added and points being added and things shifting around as we optimize this objective function. So once we've reconstructed the scene, well, what can we do with it? We've also, so we've also developed an exploration tool for exploring these photo collections. So here's a video from this tool. Um, so we're now immersed in the photo collection. Um, we can see all the photos. We can see the scene itself. And we can also browse the collection. So we can click on a photo. The camera smoothly moves into that point of view, shows a full resolution view of that image, and shows you information about it. But there's a lot of other ways you can explore the collection, too. So say you want to find a photo of a particular object, like the statue here. You can just drag a box around it, select it, the system automatically finds a good photo of that object and morphs to that view. Um, so other photos are, are suggested down here in the thumbnail bar. Uh, yeah, please. So, uh, in of, uh, for like 40,000 uh, photos, how long would it take to, uh, to generate this? Uh, table? OK. So we haven't quite, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about this more in the, um, in the later part of my talk. We don't have it working for quite that many photos yet. Um, so for this particular, um, for this early algorithm, which just incrementally builds up the scene, it could take easily a few days to reconstruct, say, uh, 500 photos. Um, it, it depends on a lot of things, but that's kind of a rough number. We've been recently, and I'll talk about this, working on techniques to scale this up and make it much more efficient. Um, yes, question back there. Get to this later, but um, so in the initial step, in the bootstrapping step, when you had those two images, how did you decide what the um, I guess control points were? And I'm sorry. How did you decide what the control points were? Uh, I'm not sure what you mean by control points. Well, okay, reference points which were the same in both images, kind of thing. How do we? How do so? How do we find that correspondence between features? Um, so that's that's done using the SIFT algorithm I, I described earlier. That gives you a descriptor. SIFT gives you a descriptor for each point. And then you can match points by finding similar descriptors in different images. Is there a question? Yeah? What would happen if you choose an uh, initial pair, which is not a good one? You have to go up and choose another pair. So, so the initial pair, it, it tries to find a pair which looks like ha it has a wide baseline and which have a lot of features in common. So it uses some heuristics to select that pair. You're right, it doesn't always select a good initial pair. Um, when that happens, um, I, I usually just manually find a good pair and, and see the algorithm with that. But I think these heuristics could also be 
uh, made more robust. Yes, please. Uh, a collection like Flickr. Yeah. If you take, what's the percentage of, say, images that we find that are bundleable? That's a good question. Certainly, most images, as uh, if you saw James Hayes, James Hayes Sigraf talk, most images are pictures of cats' birthdays. Um, <laughs> I, I, I think that it's probably somewhere around maybe 20% are bundleable, but I, maybe more than that. That's kind of a conservative guess. But I really have no idea. To, to, to find out for sure, we, we need to kind of perform a study where we just download random images and see how many of them fit together. It's not clear how, how many there are, but um, I think there are ways of encouraging people to upload bundleable images, and I'll talk about that more in the later parts of the talk. But that's a very, that's a very good point. Uh, so I, I, th I think I'll, I'll, I'll continue. The, the point of this video is just to show the, give you a sense of the interface. Um, here's, another, here's another video showing a different scene. Here we're, we're um, exploring the Notre Dame Cathedral. Um, and another interesting thing we can do with this system is annotate images. So here the user is annotating several regions of this uh, front facade of the Notre Dame Cathedral, but they're not just annotating the single image. They're actually annotating the entire collection. So if you, if you look at the thumbnail bar, you'll see that all the images are updated with these annotations. And now if we move to, to some of these other images, we'll see those annotations appear. So we've really very easily annotated the entire scene by annotating a single photo. The reason we can do these kind of operations and provide these kind of tools is because We've done this analysis to reconstruct the 3D geometry of the scene. So we know, for instance, um, what points the user is annotating when they select a region of a photo. And we can know where those points are in different images. So here's kind of my favorite example, just because it's so beautiful. This is a reconstruction of the half dome in, Yo in Yosemite. Um, we can easily find uh, similar viewpoints to a viewpoint that we like and then play those as a slideshow. Um, but we can, one cool thing we can do once we know the geometry is stabilize the slideshow. So here you'll see that the object is stabilized as we go through these different views. And you can see these beautiful transitions between different times of day and different times of year and so on. We've also had some success in using our system on historical images, such as this photo of um, Half Dome taken by Ansel Adams. The reconstruction um, part of this algorithm has been very successful. So essentially, nearly every scene that I've downloaded photos for and tried to reconstruct has worked. And here's a few of those scenes. So it includes different types of scenes. So outdoor scenes, this is Mount Rushmore, the Sphinx, the Statue of Liberty. There's indoor scenes too. Um, up in that corner is the interior of the Hagia Sophia. This is the inside of St. Peter's Basilica. Uh, the Venus de Milo's over there. So um, it's really proved to be a, a very robust algorithm. Yes, please. A lot of them are, it, 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 maybe, the, maybe the Venus de Milo is different. Is that stuff behind the Venus de Milo? Because mostly it just seems to be sort of in, taken roughly in a plane. I didn't know if you'd have problems with like severe parallax. <laughs> OK, so for this scene, all these photos are in front of the, in front of the Venus. These photos are taken from behind it. Okay. So um, it's not always the case, and, and this is another problem that I'm interested in working on. It's not always the case that you have a set of viewpoints that span an entire scene, just because people are biased in how they take photos. But in cases where if there is a good uh, span, then it, it works pretty well in recovering all, those, all the different viewpoints, as long as there's enough overlap. Uh, yeah, Bill. I had a question about just the accuracy. Okay. Um, I guess for maybe for browsing photos, you may not need the model or the camera positions to be that accurate. Maybe you could speak a little bit about um, how you might discover or figure out the accuracy of your photos and if you were to register to, you know, uh, georeference data. Or something. Th that's a good question. Um, so. You're right that for this particular application, accuracy is not super important. But you could imagine that for other applications, it, all, it is important. I don't have a good quantitative assessment of the accuracy. I can tell you that qualitatively, 
you can align these reconstructions to an overhead map, and typically they'll line up pretty well. And the photos will be in reasonable places, like they'll follow the streets and they won't be in the middle of a building. So it seems that we're getting accuracy up to, say, a meter or so, um, or you know, a couple meters. It's, it's not completely off. Now, beyond that, I'm not sure exactly how good we're getting. Um, it's pixel accurate in the sense that the image matches exactly the point cloud at, you know, up to some s small residuals. But beyond that, um, um, without ground truth data, which is kind of hard to come by, it's hard to exactly quantify how well we're doing. But it's, it's definitely reasonable. Um, was there a question back in the back? Can you, can you correlate uh, clusters of images that deal with um, an object that has some, some discontinuity over time, like say Mount St. Helens? Uh, can, can you deal with that, that sort of thing? What it would do is, if there are parts of the scene that are not changing, it would probably latch onto those and use those as kind of an anchor. So um, you, could, you could, if there is some fixed part of the scene, uh, reconstruct the correct geometry of the scene. Um, if the scene's completely different, then there's pretty much no hope in, in doing this automatically, though. For Mount St. Helens, I'm not sure how much, you know, are there parts of it that stay the same after the eruption? Yes, that's, that is a very interesting. That, those are along the lines of some of things I'd like to work on in, in the future, of viewing scenes over time as well as over, over uh, these more spatial dimensions. OK. So I just wanted to mention that this project has been used um, in a number of other, uh, has enabled a number of other projects in computer graphics and computer vision, including work on dense 3D modeling of scenes. This was work of, of Michael Guzla, uh, which I also collaborated on. But, and Hughes Hoppy also worked on this. I, I saw him earlier. Um, oh, there he is. So, uh, so th the idea is we take these internet images, and instead of generating these sparse point clouds, we actually generate dense polygonal 3D meshes um, of, these, uh, of these scenes, um, which are more useful in traditional computer graphics applications, like using them in a game or something like virtual earth. Um, the idea is that we use phototourism to get back to camera viewpoints, and then we use a new, new um, multi-view stereo algorithm to reconstruct dense 3D geometry from these, um, from these images. Again, it works well on, on internet, the kinds of Im internet images I've shown you uh, previously. Uh, here's another example of a reconstruction of the Statue of Liberty. And essentially what this enables you to do is, given enough computational resources, reconstruct all the world's important sites in 3D. Another exciting application or uh, project enabled by phototourism is this is work on scene summarization for online photo collections. Um, this is the work of Ian Simon, on, on which I was also a collaborator. And the idea is that another way you might want to visualize a scene is not by um, browsing the scene, but getting a concise overview or summary of the scene. So say you wanted to know what the Pantheon looked like. You could go, for, you could go to Flickr and, again, search for Pantheon. But again, the photos are in random order. This is not necessarily a good summary of, of the Pantheon. So the idea behind this work is that we take this set of photos, photos contributed by many different people, and analyze them to try and figure out what the important or representative parts of the Pantheon are. So uh, the idea is that when, when someone goes to the Pantheon, they don't just take a random photo. There are some viewpoints that are much more likely to be photographed than others. And these, the hypothesis is that these correspond to the important or canonical uh, viewpoints of the scene. So we do clustering on these photos to find these represent representative viewpoints. So here's um, the summary we computed from this set of photos. Uh, the first photo is the outside of the Pantheon. It's kind of the most, um, it's what everybody takes a photo of when they go to the uh, Pantheon. Uh, the next photo is what you see when you go inside and, and so on. Uh, the Oculus is also famous. Um, so how, how can we evaluate this, how well this is doing? Well, um, one way is to compare it to summaries that people have actually uh, created themselves. So here's a comparison of this computed summary to all the photos on the Wikipedia page for the Pantheon uh, in April 2007. And 
if you compare these, you can see that there's an amazing correspondence between these, these views. Uh, there's an in outside image, a couple inside images, and so on. So part of this is luck, but it also suggests that the fact that um, when people photograph a scene, it corresponds to the same kinds of criteria they have when they're actually creating a, a summary of that scene. So, so it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty evocative, um, provocative, I should say. Um, so I just want to mention that there's other work enabled, there's uh, several other projects enabled by phototourism, including work done here at uh, Microsoft Research by Simon Winder and Matt Brown. And as Rick mentioned, a lot of the ideas in phototourism have um, been incorporated into a product called Photosynth that's being developed at Microsoft Live Labs. Um, and I've been working as a contractor in Live Labs um, with, with a lot of people, including Drew Steedley and Blaze and others, to help get this project off the ground. OK, so now I'm going to return to this question of navigating photo collections. So I've shown you one interface for navigating photo collections, phototourism. Um, it works well for these kinds of scenes, for scenes that consist of a dominant object. It's pretty planar. Um, the main mode of navigation, the, the main interesting thing you can do is zoom in and zoom out of the, of the scene. But there's a lot of other types of scenes that you might want to explore, too. So for instance, scenes like this, the Statue of Liberty, which consists of a dominant object that you might want to view from many different angles. Or scenes like um, a home interior, where there's, it's kind of complex. There's different rooms connected to each other. Or um, even more complex scenes, perhaps, consisting of different areas, I interior, exterior. Um, you might want to view this fountain out in the front of the Pantheon from different angles. So these more complex scenes, Phototourism doesn't necessarily work well for. This, this style of navigating by discreetly moving between images doesn't necessarily work as well. So we've developed a new interface that, and we're submitting the, we've submitted these ideas to SIGGRAPH 2008 for, continu for um, providing more continuous controls, more game-like controls for the exploring these photo collections. Uh, so, so now I'm going to switch to a, a demo of that system. Um, so here I'm, I'm standing amidst inside a reconstruction of the Statue of Liberty. Let me uh, go up a little bit so you can see what this looks like. Um, so again, we have the, the photo collection. You can see these um, black triangles. And you can see the, the point cloud of the statue itself. Um, and again, this interface, unlike phototourism, lets me really move around continuously in 3D. And I'll click on a photo. As, get, as I get close to the collection, um, you'll see photos start to appear. So basically, the system is adaptively, continuously um, showing new photos based on my current viewpoint. So I can do things like zoom into the scene. And as I zoom in, it, it loads photos of higher resolution. So here I'm using a high-res photo of the face when I zoom into the face area. I can also move around in the scene in 3D. So for instance, I can orbit the scene. So here I'm orbiting around a point going through the statue. And as I orbit, again, it's showing, it's selecting photos from different viewpoints to display. And you get it, even though these photos are taken by a bunch of different people, you can tell that because of, there's a bunch of people on vacation in these photos, um, it gives you a, a compelling sense of 3D as I move around the object. So let me return to the talk and describe just briefly how this works. So. Um, the user is basically in control of a virtual camera that they can move freely through the scene. They can do things like select a point in the scene and orbit around it. And what the system does is it continuously selects a photo to display. So um, when the user's over here, it might select this photo uh, in green. And what it does is it projects that photo onto a plane passing through the scene and then reprojects that image back into the virtual view. This reprojection step um, takes care of aligning the photo and scaling it so that all the photos kind of match together as you're moving around the scene. Um, and again, it continuously updates as you move around. So if the user's over here, it might select this photo to display. Um, the criteria it uses to choose the photo are, are, are pretty simple. How close that image is to the virtual viewpoint, whether it's high enough resolution, how well it covers the field of view. Um, they combine to form this viewpoint scoring function. So this is great. We've provided this interface for continuous navigation of these collections. But 
it turns out that's not exactly appropriate for all situations. Just giving a user continuous controls doesn't mean it's easy to navigate a scene um, for a variety of reasons. So some applications of this might be exploring a scene you're not familiar with. And if you're not familiar with the scene, how do you know where to go in the first place? How do you know what's interesting to look at? If I just put the user in a scene with an unleashed uh, just free controls, they may not know where to go. Secondly, even if they know where to go, how do they get there? It's not always easy to manipulate all these degrees of freedom to get from one point to another. And another point with our situation is that the photos are not evenly, dis are not evenly distributed. Um, again, people don't take photos everywhere. Th there's kind of uh, certain areas where they like to take photos, and we like to encourage the user somehow to stay close to these good places to, to, to move. And finally, there's this interesting result of previous research which says that the right controls for a scene are dependent on that scene. Uh, this goes back to the work of Warren Osborne in 92, and they looked at different metaphors for exploring a 3D scene, different types of controls, including scene in hand where you kind of, uh, you can imagine you're controlling the object itself. You kind of have it in your hand and you can rotate around and move it. Um, a flying vehicle control, which is the kind of standard game-like control. You're in, charge, you're, you're in control of the um, direction and velocity of the camera, as if it's a vehicle. And a third one, eyeball on hand, which is a little bit more esoteric and not as widely used. But instead of controlling the velocity of the camera, you're actually physically moving the camera around the scene. Um, so they evaluated these three different types of controls for three different scenes. Um, this simple cube, this more complex maze scene, and this uh, scene consisting of a bunch of signs sitting on a plane. And they evaluated how well these controls work for tasks such as uh, finding, locating the three symbols on the sides of these scenes. Um, so it turns out that for the cube scene, users preferred to use scene in hand and hated using the flying vehicle metaphor which makes sense when you think of how you would actually look at a cube in real life. Um, for the T-maze, however, the ex exact opposite was the case. Scene in hand was terrible. Flying vehicle worked really well. Um, for signs, there wasn't a clear winner. Uh, but, but the upshot is that if you want to design a set of controls for a scene, you should really take into account the content of that scene. So let's think again about our situation. And there's an interesting connection with this previous work. What we have, again, this is an overhead view of the Statue of Liberty reconstruction. We have a bunch of samples of how, actually, how people actually um, looked at and moved through this scene. So each camera gives us one sample in this, kind of, uh, in this, in this distribution of, of viewpoints. So even if we didn't know anything about, this, about the scene, we could tell that there's something interesting. There must be something interesting at right where the statue is because all the cameras are trained on that point. So that's, this suggests something really interesting. This distribution suggests that a set of orbit controls are a good way to view this scene. Um, so going back to that previous work, it seems like scene in hand is a good way to interact with and move around this particular scene. So what, what this system does, this new work we've submitted to SIGGRAPH, is it analyzes the distribution of photos to try and find these good controls. So in this case, it detected two different orbits for this scene um, at two different distances, one corresponding to the uh, places where cruise ships pass through the scene and one corresponding to the island itself. Yes? Um, the triangles are of different sizes and lengths and stuff like that. What does it indicate? The size, of the, the size uh, kind of the width of the camera indicates the, the zoom or the focal length. So this image is really zoomed in whereas this image is more wide angle. So that's important when you're choosing what photo to display. You want an image that will kind of fill the entire screen. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Singbing. So, so what kind of controls are you automatically extra extracting? Is this just orbital motions? So um, I'll show some, some more examples. We're, we, for now, we detect kind of three simple types of motions. We detect orbits. We detect panoramas. And we also detect these kind of individual canonical views and um, as well as paths between the views. And I'll, I'll show that in just a second. Yeah. I think there might be a difference there between what a user, how a user wants to explore the scene and what people in the real world are actually capable of doing. 
Like here, you're really restricted by you have to be on a boat. Looking here, you have to be along the walkway up there. Yeah. So it's there's kinda... there's a bunch of things that are correlated together in how someone takes a photo, and I think it would be really interesting to analyze and try and tease apart all of these different factors. So certainly there is some at component which is dictated by you know, where the boat actually goes and where it's actually physically possible to stand. But it's, it's quite likely that the boat driver is taking a path that makes it good, uh, you know, a good path for viewing the statue, for instance. Uh, you know, he might go the right distance so that you can get the entire statue and maybe what's behind it in, in, in the uh, field of view of a, a typical camera. Um, similarly, almost everybody at the island stands back far enough to get the, the uh, entire image and the entire statue in the field of view. So I think there are, um, there definitely are aesthetic concerns that are, are, um, that are in play here. You're right that it's not, it's not strictly aesthetic principles that are guiding this, but I think that um, in subtle ways they are dictating how people are taking the photos. But, but you're right, I'd like to look at this issue more in more detail. Yep. OK, so, so we've augmented our interface to display these detected controls. So here on the thumbnail bar, we're showing these two detected orbits. Um, here the user's now exploring the outer orbit, and these arrows appear on the sides of the screen showing that this is an or a good place to orbit and uh, shows which direction the user's orbiting. So, but to get to the inner orbit, they simply click on this inner orbit icon. The camera automatically moves to that inner orbit, and they can explore this one as well. The way this orbit detection works is, is pretty simple. You can probably imagine a lot of ways to do this. We just look for long, contiguous arcs which have high viewpoint score everywhere. Um, I, I won't go into detail, but that, that's, at a high level, that's how it works. OK, so here's, again, a more complex scene, the Pantheon. It's interesting because it has both exterior and interior views um, kind of linked by these images that see through the doorway. So we applied our algorithm to this scene as well and detected a set of orbits. Uh, we also detected a set of panoramas for this scene, um, so places where you can look in different directions, as well as a set of canonical views that I described earlier. So this gives us the user a really easier way to, to tour and find the interesting parts of the scene. They can just click on these different icons and move to the interesting viewpoints. Um, so an interesting question is, how do you move the camera from one point to another? How do you actually physically move uh, from point A to point B? So one way to do it is just naively, linearly interpolate the camera parameters, but that doesn't always create a good transition. During that transition right there, there wasn't always a good photo display along the path. So what we've done instead is design a new path plotting algorithm that fits paths from one image to another to the distribution of views. So here's a transition that uses our path planning algorithm. So to get to this image taken inside, looking back towards the entrance, the, um, the path first goes through the doorway and then turns around 180 degrees to look back towards the entrance. So it gives a much kind of smoother, more, uh, more plausible, but also um, shows a photo everywhere. So here we're going, to, here's a couple other examples where we go to different statues inside the Pantheon. Here's an example of, of moving to a panorama. And again, we get the arrows on the side of the screen indicating which directions we can pan to see more photos. So we could, we could have just created a slideshow from all of these views, but then we, could, we wouldn't get this rich sense of context and sense of how everything is related to each other as, as we move around the scene. OK. Yeah, Matt. In that to it. I imagine there's a lot of interesting like, smaller artifacts in that space that people often take pictures of. Did you find that in the data at all? Or? So um, the statues are one example of that, although they're, not, they're, they're still fairly large. Um, that was only done with a few hundred photos, maybe 300. I think, I think um, it's a little bit rare to take photos of those uh, very detailed artifacts, although they exist. If we, if we used all the photos available, we might, that might pop out. Yeah? 
do you think you can do you think you can like tone map out because a lot of it, a lot of the the change in um, um, you know like shutter speed or maybe yeah. the ambient light is kind of distracting do you think you can get rid of that I think there's a there's a couple different approaches to that we've looked at we've looked at trying to correct for um, exposure variation in particular so just multiplying the intensity of the image by a constant factor to factor out intent, uh, kind of uh, a single intensity change. But there's a lot of other kinds of lighting changes that that doesn't account for. So when the sun moves, the shadow move. When the sun moves, the shadows move around. Uh, when it's nighttime, there's typically other sorts of, of illumination. Um, one way to approach that problem is just to say, well, if I have enough images, it's likely that I can just choose a subset that work well together. So then the problem is just finding that subset of images to stitch together. Um, the other more kind of challenging problem is to figure out a way to um, adjust the lighting of photos to better match each other. Um, so I think that's, that's probably possible given the right models of illumination and perhaps a, a good 3D model of the scene. Um, and that's something I'm also very interested to work on. Okay. So I wanted to kind of end this part with another kind of cool application of this, of this system. So say you go to the Pantheon and take your own personal collection of photos. So here are four photos taken by the same person at the Pantheon. Now you can't create a 3D tour just from these photos. They're too far apart. There's, there's not enough overlap. But if you combine this with all the photos that exist of the Pantheon, you can create kind of compelling 3D tours of this, of my own personal photographs. So here we're, we're again moving through the Pantheon. Um, we're clicking on the various uh, personal images. And OK, w we see this woman standing in the center of the Pantheon over here. Now we walk over to the, this tomb and see her again. And then walk over, and she's standing up by the, by the oculus. So, what we're doing is leveraging a community of images to Im enhance and improve a sense of our personal photos. OK, so now I'm going to move on and talk more about the computer vision side of, of the work I've done. And um, we've recently been working on scaling up these algorithms to hand more and more photos. OK, so most of the models I've shown you so far have had somewhere around 500 images. So, but as we've seen, Many, many more images exist. Why not use all of them? Uh, the problem is that the algorithm I described before, this I iterative incremental algorithm for reconstructing scenes, really doesn't scale to these massive collections. So the question is, how do we scale from hundreds to tens or hundreds of thousands of images? So we've done some work on this, um, scaling up to many more photos, using the observation, again, that Internet collections represent very non-uniform samplings of viewpoint. So and there's potentially a lot of redundancy that we could, we could um, factor out. There has been some work on efficient structure for motion for, um, for more ordered sequences like video, so, um, such as hierarchically reconstructing the scene and work on reducing the number of parameters that um, you, need to, you need to work with at any given point. Most of this work has um, again, address video sequences where you know the ordering. It's more challenging to develop algorithms that work with unordered sequences, such as the ones you get from the internet. Okay, so here's the Pantheon. Um, it may not look like the Pantheon. What this is is a what I call an image graph. So it's a different visualization of the image set where every image is a node, and there's an edge between every pair of images that see something in common. Okay, and then it's laid out with a graph layout algorithm, kind of a spring embedding algorithm. Um, and let me show you what this looks like. So here's an interactive version of the graph. You can see some interesting structures in this. So there's this big set of images over here. And what this is is all the images of that front facade. So you can see there's a lot of redundancy in this big cluster. Uh, here's another big cluster of images. These are all photos of that altar you see when you first walk in the Pantheon. Um, and again, there's a lot of redundancy. But there's some interesting, other interesting parts of the scene. What's this? Uh, it might be hard to tell what this thing is, but if I, these leaves tend to be these very detailed zoomed in views. Um, if I walk backwards along it, you can see, oh, okay, this is a tomb. Uh, 
where's the tomb? Well, it's underneath the statue, and you can keep walking back and see more and more, uh, more and more broader views. Um, another interesting aspect of this is that there's views like this, which are connected to both the outside cluster and the inside cluster. They bridge these two clusters. So it's critical, views like this are critical for making a complete reconstruction. So the upshot, the point of this is that what we're going to do is figure out a way to select a subset of views that captures all the salient and important information in this set of images, like um, this critical bridge node. Um, yes? No, I just wanted to ask, what's the, uh, the size of the node? What's the sure. relevance of that in this graph? OK, so the size of the node is proportional to the degree, um, the number of outgoing edges. Um, so you'll notice that as I hover over a node, some other nodes turn a different color. Those are the nodes that it's connected to. Um, so some nodes are very, very uh, popular. Others are not as popular. Um, so what we want to do is um, select a subset of these nodes that represent the entire graph. OK, here's another example of an image graph for Stonehenge. Um, you can tell it's Stonehenge because it's a circle. It, it naturally forms that shape. Um, the graph layout algorithm, it's, it has nothing to do with the geometry. The graph layout algorithm just naturally forms it into a circle. And again, you can tell that there's a lot of redundancy in some areas, like up there. Perhaps that's close to the parking lot. Um, and then there's sparser regions of the graph, such as this region right here. So what we're going to so how do you pick the positions of the nodes? So we just, um, I'm using this graph is toolkit. You just give it a description of the graph. It, it puts springs between all the nodes and figures out the layout that has the minimum energy and then gives you that set of 2D positions back. So it's kind of interesting that it, it happens to form a circle. It, it makes sense. Um, so at a high level, I, I'm going to describe what, what we're trying to do. So what we want to do is take this full graph and come up with a much sparser um, <coughs> subset of that graph, or subgraph, that still captures all the salient and important information that's present in the original graph. So I'm going to call this the skeletal graph. This is an example of what a skeletal graph might look like for this, for this graph of this Stonehenge. Of Stonehenge. Um, it, it still captures its overall loop shape. Um, and all the nodes that are not shown here are at least connected to that graph. So in some sense, it's capturing the important information. I'll, I'll talk more about what this means later. Um, but to, just, to put this in words, we're given a full graph GI. Our goal is to select a small set S of important images to reconstruct, but at the same time, in some sense, bounding the loss in quality of the reconstruction. And I'll, I'll make that a little bit more concrete later. Um, then if you were to find such a skeletal set S, you would then we, we then reconstruct just that set, uh, which can be done much more quickly because it's much smaller. Then throw in the remaining images, estimate all their positions just using very simple, local, fast pose estimation steps. So if we can do this, then we could potentially reconstruct large scenes much, much more quickly. OK, so let's think about what properties this skeletal graph should have. So it should definitely touch all parts of our original graph. Uh, say this is our, yes, Michael. You start with the full graph, and then do the skeletal graph, but then once you make the full graph faster, so. So, OK. What we're going to do is, in the end, we want a reconstruction. Right. We're going to assume that we have this graph of which images match each other. So the matching has all been done. We know the correspondences. Um, if we were to just throw all those images into the reconstruction, it would be very slow because you know, there's a lot of redundancy. So what we're trying to do is analyze this graph to figure out, for the reconstruction part, which nodes we want to concentrate the effort on. Exactly, yeah. Locally, and then bundle uh, the skeletons from all, all the sequences. That's OK. It's, it's possible that you can do that. Um, what I'm going to talk about, I'm not sure that you could guarantee this 
property of accuracy. You want to you want the accuracy to be as high as as high as possible with just local analysis. Um, so maybe we should talk about that offline. What I'm going to talk about has some more global aspects in, into the analysis. In the analysis. Um, okay. Question. Just to be quick. Yeah. SIF stuff isn't dominating time. It's all the optimization that dominates the time. There's two big bottlenecks. There's the matching, which involves the SIF features. That's, that takes a lot of time because you're comparing all pairs of images, so it's basically n squared. The reconstruction, the 3D reconstruction, though, is even more of a bottleneck. Um, the complexity is something like quartic in the number of views. So you really want to, so we've mainly been focusing on trying to get this step much faster. Now, to get a blazingly fast system, you'd also need to get the matching uh, complexity down. OK. So um, again, what properties should, should the skeletal graph have? It should touch all parts of G, which corresponds to um, something graph theoreticians call a dominating set. A dominating set is a set of nodes that touch the entire graph. So these two black nodes form a dominating set of this graph because every other node is connected to that to that set. At least each node is connected to at least one of those black nodes. Um, we want something more, though. We want to form a single reconstruction rather than a bunch of little reconstructions that are disconnected. So this corresponds to the notion of a connected dominating set. Um, here's an example of a connected dominating set. These three nodes are connected, but they're also a dominating set. But we really, this really isn't enough either. We want to somehow guarantee that the reconstruction we get is as accurate as, as it can be. So this is a little bit more subtle and more tricky to get a, um, get a handle on. What kind, of, what kind of structure does this correspond to? Um, so accuracy somehow corresponds to information. We, wanna, we, want to, we have a set of information about the geometry, which is encoded in the, all these images that we're giving to the uh, uh, to be reconstructed. Um, we, want to, we want to keep all salient information in order to get an accurate reconstruction. So we want to somehow reason about the information that's present in this graph. So what kind of information are we talking about? And how do we represent this information in a graph? Well, one thing we don't have is absolute um, information about camera positions. We don't have GPS telling us where each camera was taken, where each image was taken. What we do have is um, geometric information inherent in each edge in the graph. So every pair of images um, provides some information about the relative position of those two images. So for instance, these two images connected by this edge, if we were to do a two-frame analysis of this, we'd, we'd figure out, oh, this image was taken over here looking this direction. This image was taken over here looking this direction. We have some two-frame knowledge about the position of those images. Um, but not all edges are equally informative. So if you consider these t this edge um, linking the second and third image, it turns out that images that are taken closer together have somewhat weaker geometry than images that are taken further apart. So this edge may give us less information about the geometry. Uh, the second edge may give, give us less information than the first edge. We're going to represent this information as covariance or uncertainty in pairwise camera positions. So with each edge, we're going to attach a covariance matrix that, in some sense, encodes how much information about the geometry of those images that edge gives us. So here I'm visualizing these covariance matrices as these ellipses. Um, this ellipse is more uncertain than this ellipse um, because perhaps the images are taken closer together. OK, so now we have a way of representing information in our graph. Each edge has an associated covariance. Each edge ij has an associated covariance cij. Uh, Drew, yes. This is a 7-dimensional covariance? We, we simplify it. We are only looking at the 3D position of the image. So we're factoring out the rotation, all the 3D points, and the focal length. So the assumption is, or the hypothesis, is that this is a good representation of at least the overall uncertainty that's present in the system. You're right that um, we would probably get more accurate results if we made the parameterization more complete. And 
Any other questions? Okay. So, so we have a covariance matrix associated with each edge. Now, if we consider two edges that are not adjacent, we can, we can reason about how approximately how uncertain their positions are by computing a, a, a path between them. So here's a path between two nodes P and Q. We're accumulating the covariance at each vertex along the path. And that gives us an estimate of how much information there is linking these two nodes in the graph. So if you really want to get a completely accurate estimation of this notion of uncertainty between two pairs of images, you need to take into account all paths between them. We, we, um, we approximate this by taking the length of the shortest path between them. So the length of the shortest path is going to be our estimate of how uncertain these two images are with respect to each other. So the uncertainty will grow with the length of the path. Um, and one kind of subtle point is that usually when you're talking about shortest paths, you need scalar edge weights to get a total ordering of your, of, of your um, path lengths. Um, so that doesn't work if you have matrix weights. So we use the trace of these covariance matrices as our scalar edge weights. Um, uh, the trace kind of measures the absolute magnitude of these covariance matrices. Um, and it performs nicely. It's linear, so adding matrices will, you can, um, their traces will also add as well. So it, it behaves the right way um, with these uh, paths. Okay, so what we're, what we're doing though is we're removing information from this graph. And let's see what that does to this estimate of uncertainty. So suppose we remove this edge from the graph, the dotted edge. Suddenly this shortest path between these two points grows by, by a large amount because we have to take this detour around um, where that edge used to be. So I'm visualizing this by the fact that that covariance on Q is getting larger after I remove that edge. So somehow removing information, removing edges and nodes will increase our expected uncertainty. So now we can formulate what we want to do. We want to find a subgraph that has as many leaves as possible so it's really efficient to reconstruct that, sub, that interior set of nodes, but such that you have a small growth in the uncertainty between any pair of nodes. So that means the shortest path between any pair of nodes doesn't grow by too much. This corresponds to um, a structure called a T-spanner. A T-spanner, uh, the T-spanner problem is given a graph G, finding a sub, find a spanning subgraph G prime such that for every pair of vertices P and Q, the distance between P and Q and G prime is at most T times their distance in G, where distance is the length of the shortest path between those nodes. This, ha this um, T is called the stretch factor. It's the amount by which you're allowed to dilate or stretch lengths in the graph. It has a lot of applications in wireless ad hoc networking for um, creating an ad hoc set of routing nodes for a, for a network in a field. Um, here's just a few examples to give you some intuition about this. Suppose this, again, is our graph G. It turns out that this graph is a four-spanner for G. Um, the reason it's a four-spanner is that this edge, which was present in the original graph, the endpoints are now separated by this path of length four. So we've dilated the uh, distance. This, the stretch factor of this graph is four. On the other hand, this slightly different graph is a three-spanner. It's slightly more connected than the four-spanner. Um, again, this edge which was present is now separated by a path of length 3. So somehow this encodes more of the information in the original graph. So now if I return to this example of Stonehenge, you can see that why this might be a good uh, skeletal graph. Um, it preserves this overall loop structure. Uh, if I were to remove a single edge, say this one, then suddenly the stretch factor would grow by a by a lot because you have to go all the way around the other side of the graph to get between those two endpoints. The graph would in, in intuitively would become much more loose um, and you'd lose a lot of information by removing that edge. Okay, so our skeletal graphs are going to be these T-spanners. And just to make it completely precise, the problem we're trying to solve is the maximum leaf T-spanner problem. Given our graph GI, we want to find a stretch factor T, this is kind of a user parameter that says how much accuracy the user is willing to lose. We want to find a subgraph GS, which is a T-spanner and has the maximum number of leaves over all T-spanners. So how do you solve this problem? Unfortunately, almost 
every problem that has a form like this is NP complete. Uh, finding a minimal T spanner itself is NP hard. So it's not likely that there's an efficient solution to this problem. Um, so we just we developed a, a greedy algorithm for this problem. You could imagine starting with the entire graph and plucking out edges until plucking out another edge would break that T spanner property. Uh, Yoni, yeah. You could think of a randomized way, right? Because if you, if you randomly take out an edge, it's most likely to be a redundant edge, right? Yeah. So that's probably, so did you use something like that? <laughs> it's, it's, um, there are, some edges are more important than others. That's the, right, yeah. So you yeah. Way, I'll take a random edge, and I'll see if I can replace that edge locally. If I can, then it's probably a, a redundant one, right? So you could think of like a randomized algorithm that does it, because you really want to deal with the, you don't, you don't care about their actual T in the T spanner as much as you care about removing as much redundancy outside, right? So, well, I mean, you could do the bulk of the work in a very quick way, honestly. You're right that, depending on the value of T, you could remove a lot of edges without breaking that property. Um, we still want to guarantee that that's, that's the case, though. Um, I don't, okay. It's, it's quite possible, okay. I, I'm Rick showing you the watch. I should probably move on. Why don't we talk about this afterwards? There's, it's, a, it's a very interesting question, though. Um, the way we do it is we, we start with the empty graph and kind of incrementally add edges until the T-spanner property is, is satisfied. I won't go into detail on that, but if, if you want to talk about it more, I'd be happy to um, after the talk. So just to give the overall properties that this guarantees, it results in a connected reconstruction when possible. How, by the way, what? what, what you wrap up in about five minutes. Five minutes, okay. Um, but crucially, it bounds the expected increase in uncertainty of the reconstructed model, and that bound is defined by this value of t. Another uh, fact is that you, you, if you're interested in as much accuracy as possible, you can incorporate all the remaining information afterwards as a post-process by running, running a final optimization, incorporating all the remaining measurements. OK, so here's some results. Again, here's the full graph for the Pantheon. Here's our skeletal graph for a value of t equal to 16. Um, you can see that it's much more sparser. All the gray nodes are leaf nodes. Those are not part of the skeletal set. Um, so the interior is pretty small compared to the full graph. But it also um, captures all the important connections. So it captures that bridge node in the skeletal set. So we're able to link the interior to the exterior. Um, Here's a few views of the reconstruction. Yeah. So if there's very long uh, <laughs> edges over here, yes. those seem like the ones that are paying the highest penalty, right? Well, suddenly now you have to go a long distance. Is there any kind of sort of outlier-like thing you can do to? Though you'll notice that these nodes are actually not present in the skeletal yeah. graph. So these are outliers. These are nodes that are connected to the full graph, but there's really not enough information to estimate their position. There may be like four or five matches, and it's, it's not reliable. So there's an additional step that I didn't mention that, remove, that looks for these outliers. And they're not included in the skeletal graph, because it doesn't think it can reconstruct. OK, so this image shows the, imi the reconstruction, you get, reconstruction you get just from the skeletal set. So it selected 101 images for the skeletal set. The second image is what you get after adding in the rest of the node, these leaf nodes in using pose estimation. And the final image is what you get if you take that and do a final optimization. And one point is that the second and third images are pretty similar. So this indicates that we're successfully capturing most of the information in the skeletal set. Uh, here's another viewpoint. OK, here's a reconstruction of several buildings in Pisa, including the Leaning Tower, the cathedral and the baptistry from about 1,100 images. Um, and there are 352 images in the skeletal set. This is the full reconstruction. OK, and this is the largest reconstruction we did. It's t almost 3,000 images of Trafalgar Square. Um, there were less than 300 selected for the skeletal set. So we're using um, only 10% of the images to create this initial reconstruction. Here's another view. You'll see that. It's, it's saturated with images. We're really getting a good sense of the distribution of views in, the, in Trafalgar Square. 
OK, so here's a, here's a slide quantifying the running time. Um, the blue bar is that, is that algorithm that uses all the images to start with. Um, the red and green bars are our new algorithm that I just described. The red bar is the time uh, required to reconstruct just the skeletal set and add in the remaining images as leaf nodes. Um, the green bar shows the additional time required for, um, for doing a final optimization to uh, factor in all the remaining measurements. And even with that, we're still doing much, much better than we did before. The speed up is over a factor of 10 for these, large, uh, these larger reconstructions. OK. So with that, I wanted to move on and just talk about some of the directions I'm really excited about working on in the future. Um, and these fall into different categories. Um, city scale 3D reconstruction, more of a computer vision problem. How do you then, if you have a uh, model of an entire city, how do you visualize these large scale scenes? More of a graphics and visualization problem. And also, how do you leverage the community to do amazing projects like reconstructing the entire world? So I'll briefly just talk about each one of these future directions. If you do a search for an entire city like Rome on Flickr, well, for Rome, we get over a million photos. So I've downloaded most of these, um, almost a million photos. And I'm interested in reconstructing as much of the city as I can from this huge collection. So to give you a sense of the scale of this image set, uh, here's about a third of the images, uh, all visualized, all tiled onto a single image. So I don't know if you can make out any one of those images, but it's likely that all the important parts of Rome are, are represented in this and the other three pages of images. Here's an image graph created from a very small subset of those images. So um, not surprisingly, it tends to, they tend to cluster into um, disconnected um, subgraphs. So these correspond to the famous landmarks of Rome. Uh, St. Peter's is up there. This is the Trevi Fountain. Colosseum splits into inside and outside. Um, there's not quite enough views to link them together. But um, even though this is not connected, I think you could um, reconstruct most of the salient parts of Rome from this data set and then use other sources of information, such as GPS or sites like Wikipedia, to get um, absolute latitude and longitude so you could populate a map with all of these models. But to reconstruct this huge data set will require more sophisticated computer vision algorithms. Once, you've, once you have a reconstruction of an entire city, I think an interesting question is how do you leverage different sources of data to visualize this um, reconstruction, this huge model, effectively? So it's likely that at different scales you want to visualize different sorts of imagery, such as you know, aerial imagery, the bird's eye imagery on virtual Earth, and um, the ground level imagery that you get from these massive photo sharing sites. So how can you combine these together effectively? Can you do good transitions between these different sorts of data? That's, that's a very fascinating question. Um, I've looked mostly at controls for spatially navigating scenes, but there's a bunch of other dimensions along which photos, um, al along which photos differ. So for instance, time of day, weather, here's a rainy photo of the Trevi Fountain, and events. So it might be hard to see, but that photo on the end is a photo taken after Italy won the World Cup. And there's a bunch of people cavorting on the fountain, which normally isn't allowed. But you can imagine wanting to find all the photos of this event. So I'm very interested in, in, in finding ways to expose controls for these kinds of dimensions to the user. OK, and finally, I'm really excited about the prospect of creating sites where people knowingly contribute photos. So, so far, I've been mining Flickr for data. These people don't never imagined their photos would be used for this kind of application. What, what can you do if you create a project and a, and a site where people, people knowingly contribute imagery? Um, could you, for instance, create a model of the entire world from this kind of project? Um, this would be a Wikipedia for photos, if you will, a visual record of the entire world created by this community of photographers. Um, there's, there's some precedent in this. There's a project called Geograph British Isles uh, in which people are asked to upload photos of all, every square kilometer of, of the British Isles. Um, so I'm, I'm imagining something like that, but on a much grander scale. Um, but users, can, cannot just, users don't just contribute photos. They also know things about the world. So how can you add semantic information, tags, um, expert information about what's in the scene, um, comments to this collective wisdom about the world? Uh, the Worldwide Telescope is an example of, of this being developed at MSR, where astronomers kind of 
kind of collaborate to add information and data to uh, astronomical photographs and, and data. And finally, there's an interesting question is, it, one interesting question is, if you really want to create a model of the world, how can you get people to take photos of, of uninteresting things? So there's a million photos of the Colosseum. There's probably no photos of some uninteresting bit very close to the Colosseum. So you probably want to give incentives and maybe make it a game. Try and get people to get excited about um, filling in the gaps between these, these models. So with that, I'd, I'd, I'll conclude by thanking the people that I've really had the good fortune of working with um, over the past five years, my, especially my advisors, Steve Seitz and Rick Saliski, and all the other collaborators that I've, I've been lucky enough to work with. And a special shout out to the, my colleagues in, in the UW Graphics Lab. Um, I think that I've taken some very interesting first steps in reconstructing um, the entire world through this community of, of photographers. And I'm very excited about um, all the different directions where I think this, this will lead in the future. So um, with that, thank you for your attention. And I'd be happy to take any questions if there's, if there's any time left. Yep. OK. Um, going back to the covariance and summing, I know why you did that, because it's uh, of the graph algorithms. But usually when you do a trace of a covariance matrix, you get, you get these weird um, pathological cases of, of, of things squirting out along diagonals, because you're only looking at the, it, the, the off-diagonal terms. You know what I mean? I don't know if you've seen that or if you're worried about that. I, I haven't seen that. So the reason I use the trace is because the trace is equivalent to the sum of the, all the singular values. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, so yeah. it seems like a reasonable approximation to kind of the extent of the, of the, uh, the, extent of the uncertainty. Uh, it, 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 it depends on the choice of coordinate systems. That's the problem, right? I mean, you're not measuring, you're not measuring sort of the covariance a, away from the axes of your system. In other words, you know, you, you could be sacrificing x, y. You could be having weird uncertainties along the diagonals of your, of your. So it, it should be measuring the uncertainty along the principal directions. Um. Because the eigenvector. Right, but you're, but you're, but the, but you're only looking at the diag, you only look at the variances, not the covariances of the. It, it works out because it's the eigenvalues. It really is rotationally invariant. There, there are non-orthogonal transformations that can, of course, skew the whole thing. But that's you know arbitrary axis scalings it validates coherence. Mm -hmm. It is true. This, this some of the eigenvalues. Well, we can we can talk about it later. Sure. Yeah, I'd love to. It's it's very interesting. Good question. Yeah. Do you have anything to say about how you choose the the value of t for the t spanner algorithm? Yeah. Um, so we did some analysis of, of I, I have a slide on this, in fact. Um, go to that. OK, so there's a, a couple of things. So obviously, if you increase t, the size of the skeletal set will go down, because you need fewer images to capture um, this, all to, to make it a t-spanner. So, so we did some analysis of, of how many images you get with different values of t. I think the more interesting question is, how does the accuracy, how, what value of t do you need to guarantee that you'll get an accurate reconstruction? So this graph shows uh, there's, there's basically two bars. We compared to um, a reconstruction created with all the images. Um, we compared skeletal graphs to skeletal reconstructions created with various values of t to that full reconstruction to see how closely they, they um, agreed with each other. So the first, the first graph shows um, what you could get if you don't do that final optimization incorporating the rest of the information. So as the value of t increases, the uncertain, the difference between the kind of ground truth model um, increases as well. But the, so this bottom graph shows what you get if you then add in the rest of the information and do a final optimization. Basically what it shows is that if you do that final optimization, you, you, get a, you get essentially the same model back as the full reconstruction, even though the, um, the reconstruction you get without that full optimization is, is not quite as good. So this works up to quite large stretch factors. 
um, you, you can still get back, if you're interested, a, a good amount of accuracy. So this might be somewhat scene dependent, but our, our studies so far have shown that you can actually get by with a pretty big value of t. So what does it mean ground truth to compare the error? <laughs> it's, it's not ground truth. It's, it's just comparing to the algorithm that uses all the information from the beginning. So that naive incremental algorithm I described at the beginning of the talk. So we're using that. We're assuming that that is as accurate as you can get. And we're comparing our reconstructions to that. Now, we also compared to a model where we did have ground truth available. Um, it's, it's a set of images taken by this Stanford spherical gantry. So we know where every image is taken from. And we saw similar results with that, with that data. Error versus speed up as you vary the right. effect. Right. Yeah, that's a good point. And find the sweet spot. Uh huh. The, the other thing to look at is the reprojection error, right? Right. The reprojection error is, is for this bottom line, it's essentially constant, just as this line is constant, and it's it, it's correlated with this these um, reconstruction errors that I'm showing. But yeah, that that is another thing we should look at. Uh, in, in your visualizations, you showed a single image at a time. Have you explored how you would blend between multiple images if you wanted to show kind of a seamless panorama or something like that? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I, haven't ex I haven't explored that that much. I think that the Photosynth team might be looking at this idea of, of stitching multiple images, images together at a time. Um, you, you want to be careful to, I think, um, take into account the lighting which is something we haven't looked that much at. But if you want to create a seamless panorama, it's important to get. I, it's, maybe it's debatable. Maybe you don't need to do a perfect job. But I think you should at least try to make the lighting constant maybe between the, the images. even match up when like the, the camera views may be quite different, right? Um, there's kind of this, this trade-off. You can use images that are very close, but you may not have enough to stitch an entire panorama. Or you can kind of relax that and get a more complete panorama that has more parallax artifacts. So um, it, it, the more images you have, the better, more likely, more likely you'll be able to create a good panorama. But um, th yeah, that's, that's an interesting question to, to look at. Yeah, if you, if you try out the latest <coughs> Photosynth builds of uh, Blaze, in, in their latest version, they have something which displays multiple images at once. So you can see, and you can turn it on and off to see what the effect looks like. Okay, thank okay, you. Okay, thanks. Thank you so much. <laughs>